This is a story that happened to me when I was somewhere around the age of 12 or 13. I believe it was my best friend Anna's 13th birthday, but I could be mistaken. Regardless, that puts the year this happened around 2003 or 2004. I had known Anna since kindergarten. We had gone to elementary school together for several years, but then she moved to the other side of town where her mom remarried, so we only saw each other on special occasions when my mom would drive me across town to spend the night. This house was a weird house. It was in a pretty upscale neighborhood, a gated community if I remember correctly, but the entire area outside of the immediate neighborhood was sort of shit. For reference, this is in the San Bernardino area of California. Beyond that, Anna's stepdad was a total creep. He used to make sexual references all around us young girls, and I'm pretty sure he was physically abusive to my friend's mom. Not to mention he was generally an unpleasant person, just seemed to be angry at the drop of a hat. While this isn't 100% relevant to what happened, it helps give you an idea of the overall atmosphere of the household. So cue the night of the birthday party. I always felt like the odd one out. Anna had made a ton of new friends at her middle school, and they all knew each other pretty well. There was about 10 of us in total, I think so I had to try pretty hard to be involved in these sleepovers, or I'd end up being in the corner alone. Early on in the night, while Anna's mom and stepdad were still awake, it was a typical birthday cake, balloons, singing sort of party. Meanwhile, however, Anna's new friends were cooking up what we would all do when the parents went to bed. In excited whispers, some of the girls started telling me about how they invited two of the boys from their school to stop by at around 1 a.m., they had promised to meet them at the side yard gate and let them in through the back door, so as to not draw the attention of Anna's parents. Both of the guys were super cute. They promised me, and I wouldn't be disappointed. We played it cool until Anna's parents went to bed, a little before midnight, and then it became a waiting game. As the hour drew closer, the girls started debating who would go outside and meet the guys. It quickly became evident that although it had seemed like a good idea at the time, most of the girls were still a bit scared of going outside in the dark alone. Wanting to fit in and gain some respect from Anna's new friends, I volunteered to go. Anna agreed to join, as well as Brandy, who was the one who invited the boys to meet us in the first place. As quietly as we could, we opened the sliding glass door and crept into the backyard. I think it must have been a full moon because I remember it seemed super bright for one in the morning. Anna's yard was pretty small and empty. We crept, giggling to ourselves, over to the wooden side gate and peeked into the front yard. Someone was sitting on the curb. I remember I couldn't see them clearly, despite the nearest streetlight being a couple houses away. They were facing away from us, hunched over with their knees pulled close to their body. It looked like they were waiting for something. Their hair appeared to be sparse and wispy, and they wore what looked like a grey wool suit. To top off this strange sight, a small briefcase sat next to him on the curb. I was instantly overcome by a sinking feeling in my stomach. Something was not right. This was not one of the cute 13 year old boys that had been described to me. That was certain. For what felt like a long moment, no one said anything. We just stood there peering over the fence. Then I heard Brandy's voice beside me, speaking in a loud whisper as to not alarm Anna's parents. Josh, Eric, is that you? For the briefest of moments, I thought the stranger had not heard her. They remained with their back towards us, facing the empty street. Then, slowly but deliberately, they twisted at the waist to stare directly at us. It became clear that this was a man, but much older than anyone we were looking for. His eyes were incredibly wide, almost circular, but the rest of his face was expressionless. For a moment, we all stared. Then the stranger rose to his feet and began walking towards us across the front lawn. But it was not a normal walk. Imagine someone power walking as fast as they possibly could without running, so that it looked almost robotic. That was how he walked. Beside me, Anna managed a few words. Oh my god. Run! The three of us bolted for the sliding glass door at the back of the house, 
not daring to turn back to see if he was hopping the gate. We whipped it open, much to the alarm of the other girls, and fumbled with the lock behind us. There were no curtains to shield us from the dark backyard, so we dragged everyone into the kitchen and sat on the floor. There we described to the others what we had seen. Are you sure it wasn't just Josh playing a trick on you? One of the girls asked skeptically. Positive, Brandy replied. She started saying something else, but her words were cut short. Several of the girls shrieked. Someone was at the front of the house, pounding on the large living room windows. Not knocking, mind you, but pounding. They were obviously hitting the window with full force. What do they want? One of the girls whispered. None of us knew. After the third set of knocks, there was a long and very tense silence. I think most of us were terrified he would hop the gate and come around to the sliding glass door, which aside from being uncovered, was also fairly easy to unlock. After a couple of minutes of silence, Anna leaped to her feet. I'm going to get my stepdad, she declared. Several of us worked up the courage to follow her to the foot of the stairs, despite it being close to both the front door and the window, both of which thankfully have curtains. Her stepdad was already standing at the top of the stairs, totally perplexed, with her mom lurking behind him. What the hell are you girls doing? He asked. All at once we clamored to explain that there was a strange man outside, that he had been sitting on the curb, but ran at us when he saw us, and that just now he was pounding on the window. I'm getting my gun, the stepdad said, and he emerged a few minutes later with a shotgun in his hand. We all waited with bated breath as he unlocked the door and stepped out front. There were a few moments of silence as he looked around, and then he came back inside and locked the door behind him, clearly annoyed. There's no one out there. Now keep it down, I've got to work in the morning. There was no arguing with him, but needless to say, none of us slept much that night. By the following morning, some of the girls were trying to justify it, speculating that one of the boys they'd invited might have sent a family member as a prank. But that just never made sense to me. No normal late middle-aged to elderly man would agree to terrorize a bunch of little girls unless he was already a twisted individual to begin with. Years later, I made the connection that we were incredibly close to Patton State Hospital, as in within reasonable walking distance, which is a pretty massive mental institution but I didn't know if there were any escapes that year. The most reasonable explanation is that someone was on drugs, I suppose, but it was terrifying no matter who they were, especially considering the suit and briefcase get up. What was with that? Following that night, I don't recall ever spending the night at Anna's again, but I think it was more because her stepfather was a dick and my mom just didn't want to go around him anymore. Anna's mom and stepfather divorced a few years later, and Anna moved out of state. I never saw any of her friends again, and while we've kept in touch, we don't talk much about our childhood, and we've never discussed what happened that night. I've thought about bringing it up, but I also worry it might bring back other painful memories of everything going on with her stepfather at that time, so I didn't know that it would be appropriate. This all took place when I was around eight or nine. I live in one of the most poor neighborhoods of Las Vegas and had always been taught the dangers of adults with bad intentions. I had a best friend at the time, Gavin, who apparently had never been taught the same as me. Every single day, Gavin and I would walk home from school, three blocks from the elementary school to his house and then finally mine at the end of the street. We'd been doing this for the better half of the school year without instance. However, all it took was one singular moment for that to change. Gavin and I were making our regular trek from school towards Gavin's house, making jokes and exploring what we were going to do that day. It was usually watching Pokemon and reenacting our favorite scenes from the most recent episode. As we turned onto his street, a beat up old red truck stopped on the road. A ratty looking older man with a salt and pepper beard and bloodshot hues stuck his head out of the grimy looking vehicle 
and immediately leaned towards Gavin and me. In a sickly innocent voice, filled to the brim with worry, he asked us, Would you two help me find my dog? I think she's just down the block. She likes to run off on me, and I could really use your help. I was skeptical at best. I shook my head and explained that I really had to get home, and that my mother was waiting for me. But Gavin promptly said yes, then ran towards the truck without a second hesitation. I was frozen in place, my frame icing over in a cold fear and suspicion. The truck took off, and I was left on the side of the road cursing Gavin, and wondering what in the hell I was going to do now. As a child, I didn't realize that moment could have been the last that I had ever seen of my best friend. I didn't put it together that the man was full of evil intentions, and just wanted a child or two to do God knows what to them. A dozen thoughts ran through my mind of whether to get Gavin's mother or my own. In that moment, the very real thought that he was attempting to kidnap us wasn't on my mind. All I knew was that he gave me a very bad vibe, and I was never to go off with strangers. I had only made it a couple more steps down the road before I heard the unmistakable clunk of the man's red truck hissing up behind me. I froze in fear before it quickly took off, speeding away and leaving Gavin in its midst. I was so relieved. I turned and saw my friend clutching a dollar to his chest and running towards me to show off his new reward. I asked him if they had found the dog, and Gavin said no, that they had driven around the block, he had given him a dollar, and that he was dropped back off on our street. We never told our parents, and I never saw the man again, but it wasn't until years later that I realized the only reason that that man let Gavin go was because I didn't go, and an eight-year-old girl would remember what this man looked like, and what car he drove if Gavin never came back. I volunteer at a huge dog sledding kennel situated up north in the country. Since it was summer around the time this happened, there wasn't any dog sledding going on. We volunteers basically take care of all the dogs and train them for the winter. The owners of the kennel are close friends with my family, so my sister and I hang out there a lot. I even learned how to sled. At the time this story took place, my sister and I were looking after a kennel with our friend and four other boys while the owners went on a two-week vacation. The second day we were kennel sitting, us girls managed to finish all of the chores early, so we decided to go swimming before supper. The kennel is surrounded by forest. The neighbors on each side of us are about 10 miles off each other. There's enough room for some sledding trails and some for feisty teens to explore. There's one spot that we deemed as ours, it was 10 minutes away from the resting places off of one of the sled trails. It's a narrow stream that pools in certain places, and it's very relaxing to sit in them. My sister and our friend hiked up to the spot with about five fully grown huskies. We proceeded to cut into the path, away from the resting place, and we were five minutes in when the dogs started acting up. They kept stopping and baring their teeth until we would command them to cut it out. At about the time we reached the stream, we heard a noise like someone laughing, but the dogs didn't seem to react so we brushed it off. We went further down the stream, only to come across a group of five men and one woman. They were just sitting in the stream smiling at each other. The men were in a circle with the one woman in the middle. My sister and our friend Helene brushed it off as neighbors and kept walking. I, on the other hand, was irked. They were just smiling at each other, and it was creepy. I paused and stared at them for a while when I realized that the woman was staring directly at me. It appeared as though her smile was fake and strained. This creeped me out even more, and being the anxious girl I am, I sped walked away after my group. When I caught up to my group, we quickly stripped down to our bathing suits and proceeded to get into the particularly large pool. I was unable to relax though, and it didn't go unnoticed by my sister and Helene. They asked me what was up, and I told them about the woman and how creepy she was. Helene pointed out that the woman didn't look much like a woman, but more like a girl that was around our age. My sisters agreed, 
and added that they looked heavily medicated too. Right after she said that, the dogs went ballistic. They were aggressively growling and barking at something behind us. We turned around, only to see two of the men staring at us from a ledge above. I promptly shrieked out, which agitated the dogs even further to the point where I had to grab one of the more aggressive ones, Malik, before he charged at the two guys. One of them compliment Helene on her hair, and unfortunately for him, Helene's personality matches her fiery red mane. Get the hell away from us and get off our property. She also spat out, If you don't screw off, we'll sick these dogs on you. Then she elaborately gestured to the snarling dogs, who were now foaming at the mouths. Looking back on it, she was probably just as scared as me. But at the time, I thought she was really brave. At this point, the four boys arrived running, and as soon as the two guys saw them, they bolted. I released Malik, and he ran after the two men, instantly followed by the four other dogs and the boys. We got out of the pool, put our clothes back on, and left the forest in a hurry. We ran back to the house and called 911. Ten minutes after we dialed the police, the boys returned with the men and the dogs following behind them. They held them outside of the house until the police arrived. The men were taken away, and we were assured that they would be charged. After the police left, my sister reminded us that there were four other people that weren't caught. What made my spine tingle was when she brought it up to the boys. They replied with, What four other people? We didn't see anyone else. Mattis, the oldest of the four boys, said that they probably ran away and left when the dogs started chasing the two men. We were forced to drop the incident, and we had to swear never to tell the owners of the kennel what had happened. I found out recently from Mattis that the two guys were indeed heavily medicated, and they were also batshit crazy. I'm so glad I wasn't alone, but the girl's face still haunts me terribly. If you enjoyed this video, you know what to do. If you would like a chance to have your story featured in an upcoming video, make sure you email it to yourmaker6260 at gmail.com. I hope you all have a great day and are ready for a good weekend. Stay safe out there, and I'll catch you in the next video. And just remember, it's always scarier if it's true. For the brief of the brief of for the briefest for the briefest of moments, one of the girls asked. Skept, one of the girls asked. Fuck! I can't say skeptically.